as I was introduced, and we'll be talking about immutability. Uh, so thanks a lot for coming. I know this is the last talk of the day, uh, aside from the panel. And I know you guys are pretty exhausted, but you know what? You made the right choice. Uh, we'll mostly just look at some hopefully pretty pictures. So it will be like a walk in the park. Uh, so I'd like to start with a couple of words about my employer, Fidzai, which is <laughs> the biggest word on the slide. So we are a fraud prevention company based in Portugal and the US and one other countries. Um, and every day we are processing several billion of dollars worth of financial transactions to identify fraudulent patterns using big data, machine learning, and Scala. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, please get in touch with me. So aside from that, uh, this slide that you see here is the most important slide you will see in this talk because it's the only slide that I've got. <laughs> so the talk will be entirely live coded. This means that if you are quite far from the, from the screen, I advise you to move a bit closer so that you can see well. Uh, also, it means that uh, I would prefer to take questions in the middle rather than at the end because it will be really hard for me to backtrack. So if you guys want to ask me something or you want me to run some command and see the output, just say so. I will repeat your question on the mic for it to get on the recording. And finally, uh, this link that you have to, on, the, on the slide, you can take a picture of that. Basically, there you will find all the materials for the talk, including links to extra resources like for the reading and stuff. And you will also have a full transcript of the talk so you will be able to read it and follow along and even run the same, com the same commands that I am going to run. So with that in mind, uh, let me ask you, who has never used immutable data structures or has no understanding of <laughs> what it is? One person. Great, so uh, let me see. Is this okay? Is that big enough? So I think we'll start with a small motivating example just to remind you how it is to work with mutable data structures and then we'll proceed to the immutable ones and we'll see how that works. So I'm just starting, yeah. yes, the recording is rolling. So here I'm starting the Ammonite shell, which some of you might be familiar with. I think this is the best out of two shells that we have in Scala. Uh, so let's, let's start with a simple example like, um, an array of two numbers, one and two. And let's say we want to create another array that has just numbers two and two. So with mutable data structures, the way to go about it is uh, you just say two, two equals one, two, and then we'll say two, two. The first element, we change it to two. So that's great. We have a new array that has two and two but what we just did is we completely ruined the first array that we had. See, it says one, two, but it's actually two, two. And this is one of the problems that you get into with mutable data structures, because when you start mutating them, it's kind of hard to track where the changes are coming from, especially if it's from different threads. And basically, you can just easily ruin the data that some thread is holding to by mutating it in another thread. And of course, the correct way to do this is if you want, for example, uh, three, two, uh, you can say one, two, dot clone. And then you can modify it uh, all you want and it will not affect the original array. So with lists, it's kind of simpler. So Scala lists are immutable, which means that you can't do this kind of in-place mutation that we did. But this brings the question, is it actually copying the entire data structure every time we make a change? Because that wouldn't really be efficient. And to kind of get a hands-on approach to this and see what is happening behind the scenes, uh, in my spare time, I made a tool that allows us to visualize these data structures and see them in action. So let's start with creating a simple list, like list of one, two, three. And we'll say render list. And here on the right, I'm just having, I just have an image viewer that will display a file that I'll be updating throughout the talk. 
And this is a basic representation of our list. So you can see that list consists of a few cells, which are historically called cont cells. So the first cell holds the number one and the reference to the next cell. And the next cell has the number two and the reference to the next cell. And then finally, the last cell uh, points to the nil, which is the empty list. So this is pretty straightforward. I'm pretty sure most people are familiar with this. Uh, one thing that we can try to do is we can say uh, list two equals, uh, let's say, we prepend the number zero to our list. And then we want to see uh, both list and list two. And this is the kind of thing that we get. So what we can see here is that list two just added one more cell, but it's reusing the entire structure from the previous list. So we didn't have to copy any, uh, anything, we just shared it. So and this allows us to use memory in a more efficient way. And really the reason this works is exactly because list is immutable, because if the list was mutable, we could just mutate this blue part and the green list would be screwed up. We would modify the contents of the green list. So uh, the fact that the data structures can't be mutated leads us to, to these optimizations where we can share entire pieces of these data structures. And this is really the, the crucial trick to immutable data structures. So another thing that we can do very easily is uh, remove uh, elements from the top of the list or from the front of the list. So you see if you want to create another list that just has the rest of this list with list.tail, again it will share what is already there. So we didn't have to, to put any effort into this. And also you will notice that adding elements and removing elements from the head of the list is a constant time operation because we just have to create one cell or we have to uh, dereference one pointer. Uh, so this is great. Actually one thing that uh, I found using this uh, visual visualization tool is that some operations on Scala collections don't do exactly what you expect. So let me elaborate. Imagine that we wanted to do the same thing we did with the array, which is remove the first element and replace it with another element. So one way to do this would be uh, to do it like so. So we'll say to uh, concatenate with list.tail. And yet another way to do it is to say list updated at index 0 and replace it with element 2, which is supposedly the same thing. At least they yield the same results, right? But actually, if you look at them, you will find that uh, I'll throw a list in the mix as well. You will find that the actual operation is very different. So with list three, we used list.tail and we added a head element. And with updated, it just created a whole new list. So this operation is actually not optimized for lists. Instead of just keeping the part of the list that is unchanged, it rebuilds the whole list. So this is one of the things that I found. Well, anyway, lists are uh, pretty cool if you want to add elements or remove elements from the front. But if you want to add things to the back, um, things get really bad. So uh, let's look at list and list plus four. What happens here is that to add an element to the end of the list, we have to build an entirely new list. Why is that? Because the final cell of the list that we had is already pointing to the empty list and we can't change it. So we can't point it to our new element. Thus we have to rebuild the entire thing. And just as a curiosity, I made some simple animations. So this is um, appending elements to the front of the list and it's working pretty smooth. We are not wasting any memory and then um, if we look at appending things at the end, it looks more like this. So every time the append happens, we have to create an entirely new list, which is not great. So one data structure that solves this problem is called a queue, and the queue is meant for adding things on both sides. So let's go ahead and create a queue. Now, 
this queue that exists in uh, Scala.collection collection that immutable is called a banker's queue and basically what it is it's a uh, a class with two lists one list for the front of the queue and one list for the back of the queue this way you can put things on the front in constant time and you can put things on the back in constant time so for example if we have q and q plus 4 so this is a bit hard to grasp because of all the arrows that are intersecting each other but basically q plus 4 is reusing the same front list which is 1 2 3 and it has another list for the back of the queue which has the number 4 and if we go further and we add one more element you will see that the list that uh, represents the back of the queue is actually reversed so it has first number 5 and then number 4 does anyone know why that is? sorry? yeah exactly yeah so it's so that appending elements is efficient uh, now the question is it's all well and good we can add elements on both sides but what about removing elements in particular what happens if we remove elements from the front and the front list is empty so I have this animation that will guide us through this process so we start with the queue with numbers one two three and we'll do this we'll add two numbers to the end so five and four and then we'll remove two numbers from the front so let's add two more six and seven now this is the interesting part so we can remove one element three and now we are about to remove another element and there is none so basically what the queue will do is it will take the back list and it will reverse it and put in the front and this is obviously one operation that is not very efficient because to rebuild the entire list you need to spend at least n operations where n is the number of things in the list but luckily if your usage pattern for the queue is that you keep adding elements to one side and remove it from the other side and you average the complexity of all operations uh, on average you actually, good, uh, you actually get a pretty good performance so that works now one problem with the with the queue is that uh, it's not really that easy to get an element by index so if you want to go somewhere in the middle of a queue, let's say at an element number five, you would have to traverse the queue from the beginning or from the end, and you have to go through all the links to get to the element that you want. And obviously queue is not a data structure that you want to use if you want to access by index. And the way this is solved in, uh, in Scala is with a structure called vector that I think is also shared in uh, with Clojure so Clojure has uh, pretty much the same type of structure and let's go ahead and create a vector and see how it looks so I'll just say 1 to 10 to vector and render vector so this vector is pretty basic it's not interesting yet what it's doing it's using an array but it doesn't expose it, expose it to the outside so you can't actually mutate that array so it still provides you with the immutable interface and if we were to add an element to this vector again nothing exciting will happen basically what it does it just duplicates the entire array so clearly that's that's not something that we wanted to see but things get more interesting where you have bigger vectors so uh, and by bigger I mean more than 32 elements because these, uh, these arrays have 32 elements so if we say 1 to 40 to vector this is just big enough to, to become interesting so what you will see here is that it's using an array of arrays and that way you can represent at most 1024 elements uh, and you will notice that there are some cells which are empty at the end basically those are additional layers so you can have arrays of arrays of arrays or arrays of arrays of arrays and so on and 
essentially this is enough to hold as many elements as you can hold in a Java collection because the size of a collection is an int. So with uh, six or seven layers, that's enough for uh, all reasonable purposes. And the thing is that to get to an element at any particular index, you just have to do at most six pointer dereferences because you have to go through six layers. So for all intents and purposes, this is constant time because it's at most six. So that's really great. And another thing is obviously since um, this vector, uh, this vector is big enough to have two layers. If we add an element to it, uh, plus 1,000, for example, uh, we are now able to share in blocks of 32. And if you have three layers, you're able to share in blocks of 1,024. So the bigger the vector is, the more you can share, and uh, we can um, save the memory that way. So that's a vector in a nutshell, and that is also the conclusion of the first part, so this would be a very good moment to ask questions if you have any about data structures. Yes? Do you determine sharing just by doing object uh, comparisons, like identity comparisons? That's a very good question, yes. So I am abusing a, th a method that exists on the JVM which allows you to get an identity from the object. And that way I can determine that the same object is the same object and I share them on the graph, yes. So that's completely automatic and that way you can explore the sharing part on your own and, and see what is shared and what isn't. Yes? That's another very good question. So uh, I'm using, a, I mean, as much as I prefer this to look like magic to you, <laughs> I will, <laughs> um, I will tell you. So I'm using a library that is called source code, uh, and it allows you to capture the source of the argument that you are um, accepting in your method, and that just works automatically, except when it doesn't. So one thing that I that I try really hard not to do by accident is uh, this sort of thing. Um, if you use operators that uh, end with a colon, which are actually applied on the right argument, that messes up the positions because of the sugaring, and basically this doesn't work. <laughs> so that's a known downside of, of that library. Uh, there's an open bug for that. Uh, hopefully when we have uh, Scala Meta, I think Eugene is in this room. Uh, when we have Scala Meta, obvious, uh, hopefully we'll have a reliable way to extract the source of an expression to put it here. Uh, but yeah, more questions? All right. So in the second part, I wanted to talk a bit more about uh, a, more, a bit more about um, the main object. So. Data structure are great, but most of the time we can just reuse what is already existing. Uh, but we really want to build our own domain models uh, based on our business logic and, and whatnot. And if we choose to implement them in an immutable way, there is a certain uh, effort we have to put in it if we want to modify these objects. And I will illustrate in a bit. So imagine we have uh, a simple case class like like this employee class, it has a name which is a string and it has a salary which is a uh, long in some currency. Um, and we can use, again, we can use my library to, to take a look at this employee. So again, this is an employee. Uh, here we have the string Michael, which is the name. And we, here we have uh, 4,000, which is the salary. Now, if this was our domain model, I think one uh, pretty common or not, depending on your business operation, that we would need to do is give the employee a raise. So the way this goes in Scala, because we have the copy ma method defined on case classes, we would say raised is employee.copy salary equals employee.salary plus 10. So that's a small raise. And now if we render both the employee and the raised employee, we'll see that they share the same name, obviously, and they have different salaries. 
So that's great. Uh, now imagine we have an entire startup. So I'll show it to you. But let me just cheat a bit and remove a bit of boilerplate from the visualization. So let's say we have an entire startup and I just simplify the visualization just to remove some visual noise. So we all know now how a list works, right? So I'll just say list and it will have a bunch of things inside, but you know that it's a sequence of cons cells just for the sake of simplicity. So again, in this startup, we have the employee Michael, which is now the founder of this startup, and we have the name of the startup, and we have a team of four employees that work under Michael. And now imagine we wanted to do the same thing, which is to, to give a raise to the founder of the startup. So we would say raised founder equals startup, dot copy uh, founder equals startup dot founder dot copy salary equals startup dot founder <laughs> <laughs> dot salary plus 10 I hope that's correct yeah well you see the problem right that's clearly not the way to go about it and a concept that was invented in functional programming just to deal with this particular situation of updating nested um, immutable data is called the lens. So in a nutshell, a lens uh, is something that focuses on a part of the data and you can use the lens to update that particular part of the data. Uh, and well, I'm showing it like this, but we'll see in a few, um, uh, in a few minutes that it can actually be different pieces of data fragmented across the data structure, but let's keep it simple for now. So I'll use this library called Monocle, which is um, self-advertised as an optics library for Scala, and it, it includes other things uh, like prisms and uh, traversals. So we'll use that to create uh, a couple of lenses, and then I'll show them and explain how they work. So we'll have a celery, celery lens, which is a uh, a lens from an employee to their salary. And we'll have a name lens, which is a lens from an employee to their name. Now, obviously, there has to be some way to, to visualize it. And the way that I came up with is like this. So we'll say render the focus of the lens called salary lens. and we'll focus it on the employee. And it looks like this. So it kind of highlights the, the salary part of the employee. And the same way if we replace it with the name lens, it focuses on the name. So, so far it's not very obvious how this is useful. Of course we can showcase the API that it provides. So we can say salary lens modify whatever was there, plus 10, and apply to the employee. And it gives us a result 37, which is Michael with the higher salary. And again, if we show this, uh, we'll have basically the same thing that we achieved with the copy method, but with much more boilerplate. Uh, but the crucial thing about lenses is that you can compose them. So imagine if we have another lens, which is a founder lens. And it's a lens from a startup to a founder of the startup. Uh, then we can compose the, lens, uh, the founder lens and the salary lens to form a lens from the startup to the salary of the startup. And it goes like this. So founder salary lens equals um, founder lens compose lens, celery lens, right? So this is like dominoes. You have pieces of dominoes that have the same number and you can kind of concatenate them and it just works. So if we render lens focus of founders, celery uh, lens, <coughs> and let's say startup. So Inside the entire startup, it focuses just on one thing, the most important thing, the salary of the founder. And of course, we can use this lens to modify the salary, much like we did before. So we can say modify whatever was there, plus 10. Uh, 
uh, of startup. And it does the same thing. So, you know, I told you that there was a problem with copy methods, that it was very boilerplate-y, and then I just introduced a bunch of other things. Uh, but actually, this can be greatly simplified. If you just want to update data and you don't want to go around creating lenses, there is another library which is called uh, Quick Lens. And it's kind of operating with lenses but boiled down to the essentials. So you would just say startup modify uh, founder.salary using whatever was there plus 10. That's it. So we don't need to create anything. I really advise this library, I think, for working with uh, case classes. This is a lifesaver. I mean, this looks almost um, as concise as if we were using mutable data. And in fact, we can go even further. So we can modify everything, uh, not just founder salary. Let's say the startup is having a good time. We want to give everyone a raise. We can say team each salary. And this updates the salary of everyone. Now, this is like going into an entirely different dimension. I mean, this is not even, this is not just concise, this is very powerful, and we can express things that are probably not as easy to express with mutable data. So, by using this lens abstraction, we can achieve a lot of things. And another thing that I wanted to, to show to you is that uh, so far we've been focusing on the fields that are kind of. Uh, essential part of the data, like the fields that we have defined on the case classes, but actually we can focus on literally anything inside the data. And so here's a, another kind of optics that is called the traversal, and it focuses on the, all vowels in a string. So let's say lend, uh, render lens focus of vowel traversal and let's say Michael. So, in Michael's name, it focuses just on I, A, and E because those are the vowels there. And this is pretty powerful because then we can build a traversal that goes from a startup to vowels in a founder's name, just like that. So, we would say founder, vowel, lens, uh, traversal equals um, founder, lens, compose, lens, name, lens. Compose traversal and then we can render this. And it works great. So from the entire startup we focus just on the vowels in the in the founder's name and we can use this traversal to do all kinds of funny things like we can say uh, modify and just change all vowels to uppercase. And here it is. So that's pretty much the conclusion of the second part. So if you have any questions about lenses, traversals, quick lens, this would be a very good moment to ask. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so H is a kind of synth uh, synthetic sugar that the library introduces, and you can use it on option list or basically any functor. Uh, so if you have a list of things, you can modify each element of the list. So if you have a list of A and you provide a modification function from A to A, it will be applied to every element of the list. So in this case, we had uh, team.h.salary, and team was a list of employees. So it will basically modify the salary of each employee. And the same thing, you can modify things inside options. So if the option is defined, it will modify. If it's not defined, it will not so do anything. It goes for each or some yeah, well, uh, Quick Lens has its own functor mm -hmm. trait that it defined because the author didn't feel like uh, bringing the entire Scala Z or Cat just for that. Uh, and it's, it has instances for standard collections. I think. 
there are more interesting things going on there in Quick Lens. I really suggest checking it out. There is at, which you can use for map keys. So you can modify things as certain keys in the map. There is uh, support for uh, CO traits of case classes that I contributed, uh, where you can have, um, if you have a trait with a field uh, that is defined on the trait and case classes, each of which defines that field, you can modify that field on the trait and it will go through all the cases and modify accordingly. Um, there is support for uh, what Monaco calls prisms. So prism is a lens that um, is only applicable to some uh, types, some subtypes of the type you're operating on. So let's say if you have a type animal that has cat and dog as subtypes, uh, something that would only act on dogs and don't touch cats, that would be a prism. So in quick lens, you can also say when you modify, you can say when and a certain subclass, and it will only act on that subclass. So there is a lot of features that you can explore. If you're just into, you know, just getting the job done, I really suggest it. But Monocle is also an excellent piece of engineering. If you need some more abstraction, um, I would go for Monocle. Actually, the library that I have here for visual, uh, visualizing stuff uh, uses Monocle very happily. So it's kind of dog footing. It's built on the principles that I explained in the talk. More questions? All right. So for the final or uh, almost final part, I wanted to talk about recursive data structures. So to, to give you an example, let's say our startup uh, grew and now we have an entire company. So it looks a bit like this. We have the Acme Corp. Michael is still in the lead. But now we have several hierarchies of employees. So we have Adam leading uh, uh, <coughs> two other guys, and we have Bella leading two other guys. So uh, the company has a hierarchy, which is a recursive data type, because it references itself. So inside every department, you would have a lead of the, the head of the department, and you have sub-departments. Uh, which are here expressed with the hierarchy type. So I can show you the, the definition of this. So you have hierarchy, which, is, which has an employee, the lead of the department, and then you have the team, which is a list of hierarchies. And then you have company, which has a name and a hierarchy. So one thing that, um, um, that you can do with companies is obviously add new employees and if we were to add a new employee right about here, at the very bottom right of this uh, tree of, higher, of uh, departments, uh, we could use lenses uh, like we did before, uh, but it's not really that elegant. And one tool or data structure that was invented for this sort of thing, for dealing with recursive data structures, is called a zipper. And first, I'll illustrate how this would work uh, in terms of the API, and then I'll explain how it actually works inside. So I wrote this uh, very small zipper library, and it's based on a paper from, I think, 97. Um, it's uh, pretty vanilla. It's just uh, one file, I think. But it's already pretty powerful. So we would just say zipper company hierarchy not the easiest word to type. Uh, so then we can say move down right, move down right, insert right, new hire, commit. And that's it. So uh, this is called result 51. And if we render what was there before, and the new thing you'll see that it, it did exactly what we aimed to do. So it went all the way to the far right and it added this guy, Bert, uh, with a very low salary. Uh, so another thing that is great about zippers is that since we are working on uh, recursive data, we often want to express our operation, operations in a recursive way. So one thing that you can do is actually write loops in a very straightforward manner. So instead of saying move down right, move down right, move down right until you reach the end, you can just say cycle, 
try move down right and that basically gives the same result so it will continue going down right until it can't and then it will do the next operation uh, so just to illustrate how zippers actually work I made a very simple tree data structure so we are back to uh, numbers I think this is a bit easier to grok. So we have a tree that has number one and it has a bunch of children, two, three, four, and five, which in turn has six and seven as children. And we are going to use a zipper to um, go inside that tree and make modifications and we'll also see why it's actually called a zipper. So let's create one. <coughs> And let's look at it. So as of now, this is not very exciting. Basically, it's just pointing to the tree. And just like with lenses, I did a thing here with highlighting. So uh, one thing that Zipper has is called a focus. And currently, it's focused on the root of the tree because we just created it. And Zipper has three other fields which are the left siblings of the focus, which is this first field. Then we have the focus, as I said, and then we have the right siblings of the focus. Again, currently there are none because we are focused on the root of the tree. And then there is a, possibly a link to the parent zipper, and we'll see that in a few moments. So again, nothing, is, nothing interesting is happening. We can, of course, use this zipper to perform modifications. So we can just set uh, the focus to a completely different tree, a tree and we can commit and we get a new tree because we just modified the, the root of the tree. Uh, but interesting things uh, start to happen when we move down the zipper. So if we were to visualize simple tree zipper and zipper move down left for example and bear with me, there, there is a lot of visual noise here, but we'll cut it down just in a few moments. So in green, we have the first zipper that we had, and it's still pointing to the root of the tree. But now in red, we have the second zipper, which is pointing to the first leftmost child of the root, which is exactly what we told it to do. We told it to go down left. And it's also pointing uh, to its parent zipper, which is our previous zipper. Uh, and as right siblings, it has elements 3, 4, and 5. And just to help you see this, I will remove uh, the first zipper from the picture. So again, we have our tree in blue, and we have the zipper in green, which is focusing on number 2. And in right siblings, we have 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, I'll simplify this further by removing the tree so that we can just see the zipper. So essentially this is a pretty straightforward data structure. Uh, if we start moving right, we'll see that now number three is in focus and number two is in the list of left siblings and numbers four and five are in the list of right siblings. And since these are lists, we can easily add elements of, on top of them so that we can add elements on the left or on the right of the current focus. So we can say, for example, insert left tree of uh, 23, let's say. And here it appears. And again, since this is a list, it's inverted so that we can add elements on the head very efficiently. In the same way, we can add things on the right. So insert right. So now it appears here. Uh, we can, of course, replace the entire focus. Uh, we can delete elements, and then we move left or right, uh, wherever you desire. Uh, another thing that we can do is uh, we can go all the way to the right. So rewind right, I think that's what I call it. This moves us to the rightmost tree, which has the number five. And now if we uh, move down, let's say move down right. So now we are just focusing on the children of, the, of that tree that had the number five. So there are six and seven. And let's say we insert 
uh, some tree here. So insert right tree of, let's say, eight. So it appears on the right siblings. And now, what happens when we move up? And this is actually what gave the zipper its name. Basically, what we are going to do is we have this current layer, which has the left siblings, the focus, and the right siblings. And we are just going to zip them together. So we take the left siblings, the focus, the right siblings, we merge them, and we update the, this layer of the tree. So uh, move up. And now here we have 6, 7, and 8, which were comprised of the elements that we had in the previous zipper. And this way we can continue to go up the tree, and it will zip the layers back. And eventually we end up with our original tree, but with the new element inserted. And that's why it's called the zipper. Uh, and also you can guess that that commit operation that I demonstrated before, it just goes all the way up and then it gives you the current focus, which will be the root of the tree. So this gives us the updated tree that has six, seven, and eight. And I have, I think I have an animation of this, yeah. So on this one, I have both the zipper for a certain tree, the same one actually, and the tree. And as the zipper is moving, you can track the current focus both on the original tree and on the zipper. And you can see how it kind of uh, moves very gracefully. So this is the conclusion of the third part of the talk. And if you have any questions about zippers, this would be a great moment to ask them. Yes. I guess, yeah, that would be fair. So Zipper kind of has two properties that I really like. So one property is that you can navigate and modify things. And another property is that it actually gives you a focus in the tree. So this can be used for various purposes, like if you have some kind of interactive editor and you want to keep track of where in the tree you are and you want to keep that position to edit, this is also a good data structure to, to keep that position. So you can kind of memorize where in the tree you are. I think that's a pretty unique quality of this data structure. More questions? Can you maybe tell us on efficiency? On the efficiency of the zipper? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as I already mentioned, the left siblings and the right siblings are lists. So when you move left or move right, it's basically taking an element from the head of the list, putting it in the focus, and putting the previous focus on top of the other list. So moving left and right is constant time. Uh, now when you uh, go down a zipper, you have to, if you go down left, you have to deconstruct the list into the focus and right siblings, so that's also constant time. If you go down right, you have to deconstruct the list into the last element and the uh, init of the list, so that's a bit more expensive. Uh, that's um, N operations. Uh, going up the zipper, um, not sure what the exact number is, but basically you have to merge two lists, uh, which basically means that you need to rebuild the list from scratch. So. Uh, this will probably take as many steps as there are elements on the current layer. So that's pretty much the complexity characteristics of the zipper. And can it work on data structures other than lists? Uh, well, this one is actually a tree. So, oh. okay, yeah. uh, so yeah. I, I can speak a, a bit about this particular zipper implementation. So. It works basically on any, I can show you the definition of simple tree for starters. So I define it like so. So it has X, which is the data in the tree, and then it has a list of children, which is a list of tree. And this particular zipper implementation happens to work with anything that has a single recursive field that is a list of the same class. or 
if you add a bit more boilerplate, it can be a vector in any other collection. But for this particular case class where you just have one field that is a list of the same case class, it just works automatically. So it uses shapeless to auto derive all the necessary machinery and then it just works. More questions? All right, so just to, to wrap it up, I thought I would share some um, visualizations that I made just for fun. And uh, to make it even better, I thought I would do a small quiz where I would show you animations of adding lots of elements to a certain data structure, and you have to guess which one it is. So let's start with this one, uh, which is uh, pretty obscure. I would be very happy if someone guesses what it is. Uh, let's see how it goes. So the elements being added are powers of two for all cases. And you just get to see how it grows. And based on that, you have to find out what, which one it is. The question is, what is the data structure that you're seeing? Any guesses? It looks like a sequence. It looks like a what, sorry? Yeah, but what sort of sequence? I mean, it can be a, a list, uh, a red, black tree. It can be anything. No. No. It is a tree, I give you that. <laughs> Sorry? No, it's not a try. No. <laughs> no. Yes, it is the finger tree, yes. So this is one of the more obscure structures, but um, there is a paper in it. And uh, you can find it in the materials for the talk. I really advise it. It's a really good read. And uh, this structure is just really beautiful. I really like it. Uh, so next one. This one should be a simple guess. Sorry? Mm, nope. What was the second one? Sorry? I, I think, uh, sorry, could you? Mm, I don't think so. Yes, it is a hash map. Um, yeah, you can see lots of, it's kind of very flat. But for some elements where you get the same prefix of the hash, they get grouped into things. And uh, that's not really a whole lot of elements. But with enough elements, you can get it to grow to more layers. And um, another thing that is always interesting to see, but which I don't have here, is collisions. So I advise you to play with it. And uh, if you want to know which elements create collisions, I have a pair of numbers that I memorized. You can talk to me, and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and this is the last one. Should be also a simple guess. It should grow. Yep. So that's a bit of a uh, hint for you, that highlight. It's, uh, well, yeah, it is a kind of a binary tree, yes. But which one? It is a red-black, yes. I didn't hear who said that, but uh, it's a particularly interesting one because it's rebalancing. And I just, have, I just happen to have 15 elements here, so we'll get to see it uh, become a fully, um, fully initialized tree. Yep. So that's pretty much it. If you have 
questions about anything, this is your last chance. Uh, thank you. <laughs>